Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Polish Academy of Science uh, Scientific Center in Vienna, who is the host of this international conference. I'm Arkadiusz Radwan, uh, director of the um, center in Vienna and also convener uh, of this conference that we organized uh, together with Dr. Sonia Haronziak, who is a uh, coordinator who helped us uh, to, to put all this together. I'm, I'm very glad that despite all the difficulties, uh, we were uh, finally able to meet, even though uh, virtually, as many conferences uh, nowadays uh, take place. So we organized this conference online, uh, connected through World Wide Web, uh, but virtually we find uh, ourselves in Austria, Vienna, and where Austria is the country, the place where uh, David Irwing, probably the world's uh, most known Holocaust nihilist, uh, was arrested and put in prison for his negationist assertions, uh, a known uh, case. But shortly after being released uh, from prison, um, he was invited to come over to England upon invitation from an Oxford Union, a very reputable debating society, uh, to have a speech uh, on a forum, uh, uh, on free speech, basically. After being made a martyr of free speech or having made himself a martyr of free speech. So we clearly, if we contrast or compare those two attitudes, we see, clearly see two approaches. The one of addressing uh, distortions of truths by the legal means and the others, how they can be played on the free market of uh, thoughts and, and, and ideas. Uh, so we either can uh, criminalize or otherwise limit by legal sanctions um, assertions that are considered as touching upon taboos or sacred occurrences, uh, specifically pa painful occurrences from the nation's history, as many countries do nowadays. But we also might give them a safe conduct warranted by the freedom of speech to go around uh, until it is defeated by reason and authority. Which of those two approaches is superior? Uh, in one of his speeches, Timothy Garten Ash points out uh, to the latter as the superior form of combating historical negationism. Uh, but what if it is not defeated that way? Well, denialism, it is strongest form of Holocaust denial, negationism, is the worst when it comes to relativization of an absolute evil. But in a way, I think it is the easiest to be combated as there exists enough of scientific evidence of when, how, by whom, at all, those terrible genocide has happened. But is it really so that the truth can defend itself by the facts and by free exchange of ideas and scientific evidence. What about more subtle or gradual distortion of truth? It is not just about negation saying it never happened, as for the long time Russia denied the systematically um, uh, orchestrated and executed massacre of the Polish elite Polish officers uh, in the forest of Katyn. It was for a long time asserted it was by the uh, Germans, by the Nazi. Uh, but what about the more subtle uh, operations such as universalization of guilt, relativization, different forms of relativization or redistribution? Politics of memory is about very complex narratives. It is not just about saying it never happened. The politics of memory as an action orchestrated by states is a much complex undertaking. It is not just about confessing and condemning or about rejecting or whitewashing. It is about telling stories. It is about creating narratives that makes a nation feel and be portrayed as a victim, as a converted perpetrator or as a hero. And by doing so, the countries accumulate 
uh, a moral capital that this that might be perceived as a commodity on a very competitive international market. In his recent book, Professor Michał Wuczewski uses this notion of moral capital and attempts to reconstruct policy choices and strategies by uh, Poland, Germany, and, and, and Russia, how they build their narratives about the past, specifically about the past of World War II. But there, obviously, gains in moral capital made by one nation often, and actually usually, come at the expense of others. And it might be, uh, this might be put in such a way that this oftentimes is a zero-sum game. At the same time, when we use legal tools, and this is the topic of our conference today, juridification of history, and many of those legal strategies are by using penal law, criminal law, uh, that is a form of a censorship. And obviously, when we talk about moral capital, censorship doesn't really fit well and does not seem to be a, a perfect means of building moral capital. But still, those laws are on the rise. If we look, if we make an international comparison, uh, even in the recent years, uh, increasing number of countries either enact those laws or make some amendments to embrace new assertions. So we are here uh, again at the topic of our conference, juridification of history, uh, a complex process of interference of, of the law with a study of history and about telling stories about the past and the reinterpretation of the past. The most known form, as I just mentioned, is the uh, criminalization of Holocaust denial. But it is not just uh, this genocide. There are more like the Armenian genocide. There are also crimes by the communist regimes in the countries that are uh, uh, post-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. But it is also uh, some experience in some countries with civil law based on infringement of personal rights, where survivors feel offended by uh, media statements or other assertions. So it is not just criminal law, it has a clear uh, 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 legal dimension going beyond just criminal law. So we will attempt at this conference to revisit the moral and philosophical foundations of legal governance of history. We will share our national experiences and also look at the European and international level, uh, what efforts uh, have been made and whether or not they are successful. Finally, we will turn to something that is a little bit different, but still falls under the broader notion of, uh, of where law meets history, which is a transitional justice, how the countries that uh, succeeded with uh, abandoning their uh, 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 authoritarian regime, build their democratic future, how do they cope with their authoritarian past and this is the experience all of the countries of Central Eastern Europe actually made after the, uh, the fall of communism. Um, this is an international conference and I think it is, this topic is quite difficult for in an international conference because it touches upon many sensitive issues and it might well be that we will somehow hear in the presentations that the scholar has nationality because it uh, somehow influences our take on many things. So we will exchange our competences, our experiences, but in a way we will also exchange our sensitivities. And this, I think it adds a lot to our learning experience, even if it sometimes might be difficult at the same time, those encounters are usually quite eye-opening. And uh, this is not just about scientific conferences. Um, those international encounters, uh, even in the private sphere or whatever other sphere, whenever we discuss our collective memories, how different they might be, they are eye-opening and they somehow teach us empathy and understanding. And please let me share with you, uh, uh, and I'm coming to the, sorry, to the uh, end of my introductory talk, uh, please let me share what my uh, two uh, uh, experiences of uh, those personal international encounters and one retrospective. 
Uh, one of them is uh, many times I spend the first, uh, 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 time of my life studying in other countries, uh, altogether almost six years in Germany, but also in some other places. And uh, whenever in, we discussed uh, the, the, the problem of, of, of the Holocaust, uh, whenever I had an opportunity somehow to tell someone that my grandfather uh, was himself in, in Auschwitz as a prisoner, I was sometimes asked whether I am Jewish or if I have Jewish ancestry, which I, I have not. And this somehow shows me how, from our Polish perspective, there is so much focus also on the Pol Polish nation experience, it comes as a shock that in people in other countries, notably in Germany, uh, have such a limited awareness of uh, 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 World War II atrocities that is something that also uh, is a terrible experience of other nations than the Jewish nation. The other story is that I, the story that I tell after um, um, a story told by Andrei Folivarczny, who is, uh, well, I think he is a, 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 a remarkable uh, personality. Uh, he, he works in Poland uh, and a, a remarkable organization, Forum for Dialogue Among a Nation, and they do incredible work for commemorating the Jewish past in Poland. And once he was telling a story about encounter, uh, uh, among leaders of organizations that care of the uh, commemorating the Jewish past in Europe from Germany, uh, from Israel and from Poland. And he was actually joining the club and uh, he tells when uh, his, 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 he, he, he tells the story when the, the, the Jewish leader embraces warmly his uh, German peer and somehow ma maintains distance to Andrzej Folwarczny, the, the leader of the Polish organization. And he, uh, he was somehow uh, confused. And his first explanation was, well, I'm just joining the club. I knew they, those two guys have known each other for quite some time. And somebody uh, noticed this confusion and, and, and wanted somehow to help and just briefly commented, do not take it personally. Uh, this Jewish guy, he is a Holocaust survivor. And this came as a shocking experience to him and actually to every audience from Poland, it might come as a shocking experience, this asymmetry when our perception is so much different of the guilt and, 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 uh, and the relationship that could be somehow difficult. We come to realize this complexity and this difficult past. And uh, the, the last story or maybe retrospective uh, that shows us how much we need to somehow learn from one another is a story from my uh, birthplace, which is a, a medium-sized city in southeast Poland, Tarnów. Um, Tarnów actually had a, a big population of the Jews before the war, uh, uh, as many as 45% of the citizens of Tarnów were Jewish, so almost half of the population. And I remember uh, 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 there, there is a, a church when, where, 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 I, where my family lived uh, live nearby, and in this church is a, a, a chapel. And the chapel is called the Auschwitz Chapel, as it is designed to commemorate uh, Auschwitz and other concentration camps. And when I was a child, I, I somehow took it naturally. Uh, on the wall, there is a big uh, picture of actual bas relief portraying crowds walking to martyrdom. But what I was taking as a natural thing when I was a child, now it is somehow shocking to me. Those people are marching towards death, bearing crosses. So it's somehow, it is a very one-sided view of this martyrdom of, of the Poles, somehow neglecting the uh, primary story of, of, of Holocaust. And what makes it all even more shocking this church is just nearby of a big cemetery, the Jewish cemetery, a uh, couple of meters away that back then was neglected, forgotten, falling into oblivion. Today, things uh, turned out differently. It is beautifully renovated, but it simply shows how little understanding or awareness we have when we perceive our own history, um, uh, even though it is just a uh, uh, less than 100 years ago, and there are some people who remember uh, 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 Tarnów as a Polish-Jewish town. The title of the conference, and this I'm coming to an end, 
uh, is the dedication of history and why this intervention is about necessity, futility, and uh, uh, powerless, at the rate of the powerless. Well, necessity of legislating history. Is it really necessary? How it is necessary? Or it, the law has limited persuasive power. It is, but, but the law is also important as a declaration of certain moral values. So from this perspective, we might think of something necessary to address those difficult things by the law. But at the same time, it is very susceptible to abuse. But do we need taboos? Taboos have accompanied us throughout our history uh, uh, over centuries. Do we need this taboo still today? Futility. Futility of legislating about history because it hardly anyone is really persuaded by the sanctions of, of the law. And the rage of the powerless. And then when we talk about different sensitivities, uh, it is specifically uh, close to my imagination to somehow feel empathy to somebody who is a survivor like my, my countryman who was also in Auschwitz and now reads in a newspaper about Polish death camps. And we had in Poland some civil law suits against publishing houses that used this notion. And somehow I have empathy to the people who feel offended by this, but is really law the correct answer? Can it be a correct answer? A coercive role of law? And this will be the topic of our discussion today. And I am so happy and grateful that so many international experts uh, from so many countries accepted our invitations. And I'm very much looking forward to our uh, discussion today. And having said this, I would like to hand over to Professor Michał Balcezak uh, from the Copernicus uh, University of Torun, who will be the chairman of the first panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Radvin, and good morning to, to everybody. Uh, I was honored with the proposal to, to chair this first session, and I consider it uh, an honor. Uh, perhaps as a participant to this conference, I should not uh, say, but I will, that I am really impressed by, the, um, by both the topics and the, um, the speakers, their, their profiles. It is really, um, I think, a great opportunity to discuss extremely important matters, and I'm looking forward to it. But without further ado, I would like to now officially start uh, the first session of the conference, which will deal with moral, philosophical and cultural foundations of legal governance uh, of history. We have four speakers in this panel, and each speaker was allocated 15 minutes. Uh, followed by a discussion, um, and I am sure that we will have um, this opportunity to, to exchange views and to ask questions and, and discuss. So, um, if, permit me now to introduce to you the first speaker, Professor Yuzhi Priban, and uh, Professor Priban graduated from Charles University in Prague, where he was appointed Professor of Legal Theory, Philosophy and Sociology in 2002. He was also a visiting professor or scholar at European University Institute in Florence, several very distinguished American universities, as well as Flemish Academy of Brussels University and also University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, Iji Priman has published extensively in the areas of social theory and sociology of law, legal philosophy, constitutional and European comparative law and theory of human rights. He is an editor of the Journal of Law and Society and a regular contributor to the Czech and international media. Professor Priban will speak on a political and legal constitution of collective memory and its functionaries on post-national Europe of historical hopes and fears. Uh, Professor Priban, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Jen Dobry. Uh... Good uh, uh, morning, uh, good morning, or I should say in Welsh, Borida uh, from Cardiff. And uh, I f uh, first of all want to 
thank uh, Professor Radvan and Dr. Horonziak for organizing this uh, great uh, event in these very exceptional circumstances. It's always nice to be in Vienna, particularly before Christmas, but uh, we are sitting here and we're doing it online only, but uh, with our minds and our memories, we are there. And um, I feel very privileged to have this opportunity to contribute to the conference. And uh, I will just summarize briefly my argument and uh, uh, I hope to return to some details uh, during the discussion. Uh, when I was thinking about this theme, it actually is a theme which is very close to um, what I was doing as a young researcher still in Prague and uh, doing my uh, visiting fellowship in South Africa in the 1990s and comparing post-communist and uh, uh, post-apartheid experiences, uh, juridifications, public memory um, uh, procedures, uh, truth and reconciliation commissions, and many other things. Uh, so, um, first of all, I think, and, uh, and of course, striking similarities, even more striking differences. And these differences accompany not just post-apartheid and post-communist experiences, but also differences, huge differences within post-communist countries. And uh, I believe that these differences also help to explain why today we have different state of uh, democracy and the rule of law in different post-communist countries. Because I believe that the way we dealt with the past uh, strongly affects our presence and future. So uh, the first uh, statement here is that uh, um, in the wake of democratic and constitutional transformations in the 1990s, every country had to deal with the past and this dealing with the past is really important from the legal perspective, because if you don't deal with the past, the past will deal with you. It will keep haunting you and you will never get rid of it and never, never will not get rid of it, but come to terms with it and deal with it. Uh, it will uh, return uh, as a specter of the past. Uh, why? Because uh, right after uh, 1989, um, uh, dealing with the past meant uh, two different things. From the legal perspective, it was a question of doing justice. Uh, rehabilitations of political prisoners, um, uh, restitutions of uh, unjustly confiscated property, and um, also um, uh, the questions of uh, punitive justice, of um, uh, retribution for the crimes that actually happened. And uh, for that reason, of course, you have to have clear distinguishing, uh, clear distinction between the authoritarian unjust past and the democratic presence and the commitment of democratic governments uh, to deal with these injustices and crimes. That's why uh, the 1990s had this huge legislation in the field of uh, rehabilitations, restitutions, and also um, uh, criminal justice dealings with crime. It's fascinating to see how especially criminal justice failed in all countries for technical reasons and uh, even in the countries such as Germany, uh, top brass uh, communist officials such as Erich Mielke, um, uh, the Minister of Interior and the head of Stasi uh, was eventually tried on the murder of a policeman in the Weimar Republic in early 1930s, in it, I guess. Uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a very heavily juridified uh, period of dealing with the past. Uh, and uh, uh, this past is uh, dealt with as unjust, but also 
as fearsome past. You have to do something about the past officials to, um, uh, uh, to uh, stabilize the democratic emerging regime. And this brings me to the second aspect, which is not dealing with the past to protect the present and save the future, the democratic future. And this is the controversy of lustration laws. As we know, 1992, a big debate uh, in uh, uh, Polish parliament, uh, uh, lustrations declared against human rights and uh, uh, re leading to the resignation of the government. And uh, then for the whole period of 1990s, the Polish, uh, but also to some extent Hungarian public was uh, gossiping who is who who is whose agent yeah and uh, in czechoslovakia later only in czech republic after the split of czechoslovakia um, uh, the uh, parliament uh, enacted the lustration law which was heavily legalistic in the spirit of the austrian legalism uh, legislating for special professions uh, which are subject of lustration for which some professions in the past and positions in the past were deemed unfit. Discriminatory law? Indeed. Um, I was myself one of the critics uh, of this uh, morally very divisive law. And nevertheless, uh, in the end, it proved uh, as a stabilizer of uh, the um, new statehood to such extent that uh, at the turn of the century, if you googled lustrations, uh, most uh, the first um, uh, links were to protecting your car yeah, and car windows, not uh, uh, protecting your political um, administration. Uh, it, uh, uh, what is the result? Uh, that today, uh, Czech Republic has Prime Minister uh, who is, uh, well, a corrupt billionaire, of course, yeah, we know them all around in the region and not only in the region. Uh, uh, here in the Western Europe, uh, oligarchies uh, are in uh, government as well. But uh, it's uh, what is fascinating that uh, he is a secret po former secret police agent. He tried to clear his name and he failed uh, uh, before the Slovak court because he's a Slovak national by, uh, by origin. Uh, so dealing with the past, is um, uh, having um, uh, these uh, various unintended consequences. So today, uh, actually, this communist past is not of public interest or big political struggles, unlike in countries such as Hungary and Poland, which still has this uh, um, uh, democratic backsliding driven by dealing with the communist past. We know Viktor Orban's famous uh, uh, um, electoral slogan, 20 years for 20 years, yeah? that uh, you will end up in 20, uh, you will get 20 years in prison for how you ruined our beautiful country. So dealing with the, the, the post-communist left. Uh, uh, so this brings me to the the second uh, uh, um, uh, aspect uh, of dealing with the past and juridification of the past. Here we are not talking about the justice of the past, historical justice, or the protection of the democratic presence uh, of the emerging democratic uh, constitutional system. Here we talk about institutes of collective memory. And this is something which uh, Professor Radwan mentioned in his insightful introductory uh, um, uh, remarks. Uh, it's uh, the question of whether you can and to what extent actually you can codify and canonize public memory, national memory, and give it the power at, of an officially sanctioned uh, narrative. Uh, here, uh, there is a striking difference, and that's why I mentioned lustrations, for instance, because in countries such as Slovakia or Poland, in the end, institutes of national memory or institutes of collective memory, uh, they uh, actually perform administrative functions. Uh, 
What happened in Czech Republic was that uh, the conservative government, conservative liberal government, I should emphasize, living in Central Europe uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, the first decade uh, of the of the century, uh, they pushed for a legislation for the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes. And here is a problem because Czech Republic had probably the most thorough administrative process of decommunization, the most um, you know, complex uh, restitutions, which were primarily uh, uh, natural restitutions, and uh, it had the law on uh, the act of the uh, um, uh, lawlessness of the communist regime and resistance to it, and yet, um, 15 years on, you have a go particular government pushing for a special institute. You have to say this collectivization uh, of um, uh, public memory or national memory, collective memory, uh, is a dangerous um, um, uh, evolution to my uh, uh, view. Uh, in my view, I believe that uh, in a free democratic society, if you have free um, uh, university uh, institutes, uh, you have um, uh, free science of history, recent history, um, to sanction officially uh, an institute like that and give it the authoritative voice of the official voice of collective memory is the first step towards democratic backsliding. Because if you have to nationalize memory, the question is always who is speaking? And who is speaking? This is the cancel culture sent to European way. If you have a different narrative, you push uh, um, uh, the official contestation out. What is fortunate in Czech, uh, in, uh, uh, Czech uh, context is that um, this Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regime has the academic board, which is appointed by different constitutional bodies. And so it, its composition changes with uh, the political preferences. Unlike in Poland and Hungary, Czech Republic always had, a co had coalition governments and uh, uh, 10 years later, the, uh, the board of the Institute is progressively left-wing pushing the, cons the, the original narrative out. So I'm not saying that uh, something is good, something is bad. I'm only suggesting that in free society, contestations of public memory are always subject to um, uh, free Con academic contestations and not political authorizations. And uh, when we uh, compare it, and here I'm gonna uh, coming, uh, I'm coming already uh, to my last uh, uh, part, uh, because um, uh, the official institutes, uh, so in, in my thesis, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes uh, did more harm than good in the last 10 years in uh, um, uh, uh, Czech um, context. It never achieved uh, uh, public authority. It never achieved academic authority. It had few um, uh, public scandals, uh, but uh, the, the collective memory and its voices, plural voices, are formed somewhere else. And that's very good. And it's pluralistic. Why is it good? Because in modernity, by definition, uh, uh, there are no functionaries of collective memory. We are in uh, every nation, every society has um, uh, memory to and things in the past to be deeply ashamed of, included British uh, Empire. This wonderful British Empire is now coming to terms how, for instance, the city of Bristol was growing its wealth and affluence on a mass scale, a massive scale uh, slave trade. But uh, we have uh, memories we can be justly proud of. And uh, um, uh, so uh, what I want to say is every memory 
collective memory is not a matter of archive only. It's a question of selection of which things we want to memorize, which things we want to be proud of, which things we have to deal with as grossly unjust, with which things have to be addressed to learn from the past. And here I want to say the only exit, decent exit strategy for any institutes of national memory is to denationalize these stories and turn them into the European framework, European context, because the European um, uh, context gives us um, the European history of fears and hopes. Fears, uh, obviously what happened in Europe um, in the last century is something, it's, it's a complete collapse of humanity. And uh, we want to say never again, never again Auschwitz, never again uh, labor camps in the Stalinist Russia, never again genocides. But at the same time, we have to have a positive story. Yeah? Uh, because if you don't deal with the past, you're going to end up like Austria. Still, David Irving more welcome in Austria than in Germany, yeah? uh, because Austria is always treating itself or was treating itself as the first victim instead of uh, at least collaborator in the horrible Nazi crimes and the Holocaust. So if you don't deal with it, you're going to end up with oblivion. If you deal only with the past, you will start hating everything about your identity and present. You have to have a positive story. You have to have a story of hope, which you can learn from the past. And uh, um, it uh, brings me to the conclusion that juridification is important for the justice matters. For the collective memory, Law is far too weak, and I want to say far too divisive. Law, um, uh, and uh, every country will have its laws of dealing with the past, and uh, frankly, mentioning David Irving, uh, yes, it's shocking and disgusting, but uh, people uh, from Central Eastern Europe or Germany are always shocked by uh, what uh, uh, you can hear people uh, saying and anti-Semitic tropes in British society. Just think of former mayor of London, Ken Livingston. Uh, so it's not just the extreme right, it's also progressive left, uh, which would make uh, skinheads in Chemnitz uh, almost blush. Yeah? So every every society has its undealt and uh, the past to deal with. As regards the juridification, let's rely on uh, constitutional projects uh, which uh, will address the risks of the past and at the same time provide for positive, denationalized, collective European memory. Thank you very much and uh, I said enough. Uh, Professor uh, Preben, that was extremely interesting. Uh, I took some notes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would be very tempted to even to engage into the dialogue now, but we need to move forward, of course. And uh, now I'd like to invite um, Dr. Milos Matuszek. Dr. Matuszek uh, is a lawyer, a journalist, and free speech activist living in Zurich. He wrote his PhD about Holocaust denial bans and taught German law at uh, the Sorbonne School of Law for five years. He has been writing for 15 years for different media outlets such as NZZ, Welt, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, and has recently launched his own publication, Freischwebende Intelligenz, where he writes about free speech matters. He launched an open letter for open debates and against cancel culture in September 2020. Dr. Matuszek's uh, topic is um, as follows. A good idea, moral philosophical justification of legislative interference with collective memories and historical narratives. Dr. Matuszek, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Balcerzak. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you some ideas uh, 
about the connection between Holocaust denial bans and memory. I have to admit that was a topic that um, interested me a lot 10 years ago when I wrote my PhD thesis. I have uh, since then uh, had only little opportunities to come back to this subject and I have to admit that my research had a very little impact <laughs> on, uh, on uh, let's say, legal doctrine, at least in Germany. There are little researchers who admit that, but I, I do this uh, gratefully and maybe we can um, see through my speech why this has been the case. Um, my affiliation, you have you have pointed out rightly, I'm not anymore at the Sorbonne uh, University, so um, I'm talking here now not as a pure researcher, but also as a as a um, let's say journalist and um, let's say normal normal citizen. Um, Holocaust denial bans, uh, we heard it before, have become very popular in Europe, mainly during the 90s. Uh, we had the first law in France in uh, 1990, in Germany 1994, in Poland 98. The European Union discussed a common framework later on in 2008 in order to harmonize legislation on that matter all over Europe. Uh, this endeavor has finally not come to an end. We can say it has failed um, due to the differences between the member states in that sense. Um, those laws have triggered a lot of discussions from the beginning. Is it the right way from a legal policy approach? Do these laws lead to more legislation in the same sense? Are we entering therefore on a slippery slope? And finally, are these laws an infringement to liberty of expression and so on? All these questions were necessary at that time and they are actual today even more as we see with discussions around climate denialism or corona denialism. We see that those questions have entered actual public debates, um, but more from a societal point of view, not by the way of criminal law itself. But the label denier has become today an, a kind of weapon in debates in order to exclude participants from debates. We are therefore confronted with a more societal type of sanction framework today. And this, um, I just give it as a, as a short um, reminder at the beginning, should maybe um, make us think of those laws in a more um, critical way, in general. But I want to limit my expose to two major points today. Um, the first point is, what is the scope of protection of Holocaust denial bans, at least from a perspective of German law, which uh, was my main field of research? The second question, can collective memory be a legal good in the sense of modern criminal law? As far as the first point is concerned, from the perspective of German criminal law doctrine, criminal law is seen as a set of rules with sanctions, which are basically set up in order to protect certain legal goods. So from the perspective of German criminal law, we are not fighting against certain phenomena, that is the political view, we are um, protecting certain legal goods, such as property, liberty, the climate, etc. German doctrine seems to split in two fractions, generally, when it discusses the scope and character of the term legal goods, or as we say, Rechtsgüter. Uh, there is a positivist sociological branch or school that leaves all power to the lawmaker in order to decide on what is worth, in his opinion, to become a legal good. Those are the ideas of Karl Binding, uh, 19th century scholarship, um, which became also strong, maybe even dominant in Poland. In that sense, the lawmaker is unbound. A legal good is simply a kind of format, a kind of vessel, which can be filled with almost every content which serves the interest of the state. The liberal school, whereas, limits the scope of legal goods. In that sense, the lawmaker cannot define every interest as a legal good, but should restrain himself to the classical goods, such as liberty, property, and so on, which means um, goods that can be found even before the creation of a certain state. From a practical point of view, this conflict um, can be regarded as settled now. The German Constitutional Court has never accepted a sort of limitative kind of constitutional block within criminal law as the liberal school would have liked to. 
one argument was that they basically said, okay, we now have the protection of the Grundgesetz of the German constitution. Those legal doctrines um, have started at a time where there was no protection from, um, from um, basic, uh, basic laws or let's say human rights at all. So from that point of view, it's the basic rights from the constitution that only can limit the lawmaker, not a doctrine within criminal law, which is, I think, from a democratical point of view, quite understandable as those scholars are not um, uh, elected uh, or in any way legitimated. In 1994, the German lawmaker passed a law concerning Holocaust denial bans, which was included in Article 130 of the German Criminal Code as a part of its incitement legislation. So it's forbidden with a sanction of up to five years of prison to partly or completely deny the existence of certain crimes which were committed by the Nazis during World War II. Um, from the point of view of the legal doctrine, the legal good discussion has always been, um, let's say, an existing discussion because there was because it, it was a new law, it, it came basically to that point to ask oneself which legal good is protected. Um, mainly the scholars confirmed that Holocaust denial bans were seen as to protect the legal good of public peace, as it's inserted already in the paragraph about incitement. Um, other legal scholars favored the honor of the victims or the descendants, um, others favored human dignity as a protected legal good. I tried to show in my, in my thesis that none of these legal goods are fully convincing um, and therefore open a gap for a new legal good. And the arguments are as following. Um, the public peace as a legal good basically is a passepartout for almost everything. It's the most obscure legal good uh, we have in the criminal uh, code. It has elements of potential violence, um, security concerns. Um, it mixes uh, things like the harmonic living together with identification patterns between state and the people. So it's a nice uh, melange, as, as you might say in, in Vienna, of, of different, different topics that uh, not really have uh, a lot of to do, um, vice versa, and therefore Public peace is always referred to when the lawmaker doesn't know exactly what to um, what to protect. Um, human dignity is a special notion in the German Constitution. It's at the Article One of, of the German Grundgesetz. Um, the claims of uh, Holocaust denial often miss the personal targeting of people. Therefore, this argument of, of relating to human dignity has been refuted by a lot of scholars. Um, Holocaust denial concerns the historical deeds, the historical facts themselves, without having to refer to special persons. Um, the same argument concerns um, the legal good of personal honor of the victims and descendants. Um, and generally, there is no targeting of special people itself. And the second argument we can raise here is a systematic one, um, because Article 130, Paragraph 3, is a simple Holocaust denial ban, different from so-called qualified denialism, which includes also the defamation of a person and has been forbidden already before the law of 1994. So as to take an example, saying that the Holocaust has not happened as a simple claim is a simple Holocaust denialism, saying that the Jews have invented the Holocaust in order to get money from the Germans would be a so-called qualified historic, um, let's say, um, um, Holocaust denialism. Um, therefore, there's a kind of void, there's a kind of, of lack in the discussion, which I tried to fill um, with my, um, my thesis. So I had the impression that this question is not, not fully, fully resolved. Um, I was inspired by the legal situation in Poland and France during my uh, research time, um, where the questions of uh, memory have been far more present than in the German legal discussion. Of course, there has been a, a societal discussion about memory going on in Germany for the last, uh, well, let's say, at least 30 years. 
Um, and I try to have shown in my study that the protection of memory of a historical event, which can be defined um, as a kind of standard of knowledge about an event in a broader population, is actually a more suitable legal good. I wouldn't go so far as to extend it to more events than this one and would rather look at it from a restrictive point of view, but I still think it's more honest to to name to name the game and say, okay, basically it's about memory. It's not about about honor or um, a public peace. Um, the whole idea resides on the alleged fact that also, of course, liberal societies need some binding ties in order to create some form of cohesion. Historical events can be a common ground for cohesion. They can, of course, also be a point of discord. So in that sense, we don't have a completely clear um, reference point in liberal societies. As modern nations are also imaginative communities, as Benedict Anderson states, historical events as reference points seem to hold a certain ground as far as knowledge about them can be taken for granted. Modern nation states, therefore, are also communities of memory. The term collective memory has been created by the sociologist Maurice Halbwachs in continuation of the sociological reasoning patterns created by um, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, who referred to a collective consciousness which may bind societies together and is expressed also in criminal sanctions. The idea of Maurice Halbwachs was therefore that not only individuals have a memory, but also entities such as groups, nations, etc. The German Egyptologist Jan Asman looks at this from a point of communication and culture. There is a communicative memory concerning recent events, which uh, goes as far back as to up to 100 years. So it's events people are still talking about. And there's a cultural memory concerning important reference points in a far more distant history. Parting from these ideas, I see collective memory as the main legal good for Holocaust denial bans for following three reasons. First, the scope of Holocaust denial is to destroy a common ground of knowledge about the Holocaust. Holocaust denialism has been a way of um, uh, introducing ideas in order to make nazist and fascist ideas again suitable in society in order to get rid of the Holocaust. The Holocaust deniers thought that they can make certain fascist views again, um, let's say, um, popular in, in, broader, in broader populations. Um, Holocaust denial is made in order to raise questions and doubts, therefore, about the historical facts and to replace them by a new set of alternative facts, as we call them today. Second, the memory of special events such as the Holocaust um, which has ever since been a marker and main reference point for political, legal and societal discussions, can be looked at as a valuable state of mind. So there, here we are in the, in the logic of the, of the legal goods, the lawmaker decides what state of interest is valuable. And um, we have seen in, in discussions arising from historians, from um, even cultural and uh, collective identity um, point of views that the Holocaust has uh, had, well, it was probably the main reference point of post-war Germany's, uh, um, let's say, uh, public public discussions. It was shaped by numerous discussions. It's inserted in school books. It was accompanied by cultural works and so on. So we can say that the knowledge about this event is something that is valuable to our societies. Third, um, criminal law is not blind to non-material states of consciousness. Okay, we can say that um, also property, the idea of property is a non-material state of consciousness. We cannot take away property even if we steal it because property stays uh, basically at, uh, at the person it belongs to. And the state protects states of consciousness in other laws as well. Uh, we might think, for example, about money counterfeiting. 
which undermines the confidence in a state's monetary standard. So the state operates with um, consciousness and with uh, uh, mental states, even if he protects uh, legal goods. So criminal law um, can, of course, only be the ultimate ratio for a protection of this kind. And as I stated before, it should be limited and restricted. In my opinion, um, it is an, an ultimate ratio for, for three reasons. First reason, um, historical consciousness is by itself a vulnerable state of consciousness as knowledge vanishes over time. So there's a natural erosion. Second argument, um, with time passing, there's also a personal void as people directly having witnessed these events are, are dying and cannot give first-hand witness testimony anymore. And third argument, there's also a structural problem as Holocaust denial speech can only be very difficultly opposed. And um, the way of a more speech approach in that sense is of little help as any discussion of the existence or non-existence of the Holocaust or another um, historical event might give the impression that, that the facts can be debated. So this is a, a problem finally, which um, shows that it's not so easily resolvable by the normal debate means and therefore we can see in it another argument in favor of a of a legislation in that sense um, to close my argument um, the finding of this new legal good is in my sense or in my view consistent with at least the positivistic branch of criminal law and is justified also from a point of view of constitutional protection of freedom of expression. The uh, Constitutional Court um, does not refer to a certain legal good. Um, it basically looks at these questions from a structural point of view and it ex excludes by its jurisprudence so far any um, knowledgeable um, denialism of facts. So this is not a scope of, of protection to, um, to state uh, false, false facts which is basically also the same from a, from a um, United Nations point of view, but uh, without excluding um, certain facts from, from the debate so far. Um, in my point of view, it's therefore a more sincere approach than the masking of the, the law scope by existing legal goods, such as public peace, honor, or dignity. When we come to the question, is it a good idea in general? It looks to me as a more specific and grounded legal basis to Holocaust denial bans that yes. In a broader sense, um, the question is rather, and now I speak in hindsight to the last 10 years or so, speech bans are always to be looked at in a very strict sense. We are living in a time of narrowing down of debate corridors. We have cancel culture spreading in the cultural sector. We have deplatforming at universities and so on. And we have a spread of the narrative of fight against anti-Semitism from certain entities often funded by the states. Um, in Germany, for example, um, there seems to be quite an obsession to see anti-Semitism almost everywhere, which is pernicious among all, especially for the real dangerous anti-Semitism. I can remember from last week a speech um, by Mrs. Kahane, a former uh, Stasi, um, uh, Stasi info information person that is now leading a state-funded um, um, state-funded foundation, the Amadeo Antonio uh, Foundation, who stated publicly that um, every conspiracy theory and even questions about Bill Gates and vaccines are anti-Semitic. And I think when we hear those figures publicly speaking being funded by the state and the state is even giving more money to these foundations in the next, next years, we're talking about 1 billion of euros, um, this raises certain questions about official truths, about narrowing of debate corridors and a kind of non-criminal law approach to sanctions, sanctions by, let's say, um, informal entities, by um, basically um, journalists or other public figures who can, by stating certain, certain things, um, exclude other people from debates. So these laws, in my opinion, have to be an absolute exception. I look at them far more critical than I did um, 
10 years ago, I have to admit. Um, otherwise, I think it's the opening of Pandora's box. And the creation of legal taboos is in itself dangerous. It can spread and have influence on all kinds of fields, um, leading finally to less speech, more censorship, and a manufacturing of consent, which is pernicious for a free and open society. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Matuszek. These were also extremely um, interesting, valid comments. Mm, I also uh, I noticed I've learned that you might not be able to be with us during the discussion. Uh, I very much hope that we'll be able to mm, perhaps exchange views since on some later date or um, uh, in another format. Uh, anyway, um, now I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Ausina Pasbenskiene. Uh, Dr. Pasbenskiene is a Vice Dean, Lecturer and Researcher at the Faculty of Law, uh, Vitautas Magnus University. Her research interests are education law, law and technologies, human rights in education. Currently, she's a researcher in the project Integrity Study of the Future Law, Ethics and Smart Technologies. Uh, Dr. Pasvenskene, Labasritas, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Labasritas. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, a big thanks for the organizers giving an opportunity to participate and be part of this uh, great event. And uh, as was already mentioned, I would happily be uh, in Vienna now and uh, be looking into the eyes of the audience while speaking rather than my monitor. Uh, despite that, it's an honor today to discuss uh, the topic of academic freedom, which was the research topic of my doctoral dissertation. Um, so now about the importance, uh, the significance of this uh, concept. Uh, John Stuart Mill argued that uh, truth emerges best from a marketplace of ideas from which uh, no opinion is excluded. Uh, Mill's principle allows both teachers and uh, students to follow their own good in teaching and learning in their own ways, as long as they do not cause harm to others or hinder them from their own endeavors for what they regard to be good. The traditional Humboldtian concept of academic freedom from its emergence in the medieval times until recent is vital uh, for the fulfillment of uh, the mission of higher education institutions for an ability of academics and students to participate in unrestricted and free teaching, uh, research, uh, publication, expression, and to foster an open inquiry as a core value of higher education. Uh, traditional academic freedom simply meant having uh, the autonomy to pursue the truth, regardless uh, of where it led. And uh, it is agreed that uh, a previous key function of the medieval university to pursue divine truth uh, has found a place in the modern university. Uh, today, there is uh, a universal consent that it is extremely important uh, to safeguard academic freedom as it protects uh, the creation of knowledge within universities, ensures educating students to think for themselves and develops uh, the whole person. Uh, academic freedom is uh, perceived of a uh, transcendent value, not merely to members of the academic community, but to society at large. It is uh, considered as a prerequisite for higher education to, be to become the key in building and sustaining our future. Uh, academic freedom is a legal concept which uh, has found its position in numerous European constitutions and uh, national and institutional higher education regulation and um, its paramount importance and the need for its protection are underlined in various international conventions and other international and region regional documents. Uh, the most significant reference to academic freedom can be found in Article 13 of the 
Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which indicates that academic freedom shall be respected. Uh, even though uh, it is not explicitly provided for in every constitution or international convention, its protection is often implied uh, by other fundamental rights. Uh, a good and certainly a representative example is the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which does not uh, include a specific provision of uh, uh, academic freedom. However, the European Court of Human Rights uh, has brought issues regarding academic freedom within the ambit of European Convention on Human Rights, uh, in particular under Article 10, which guarantees the right to freedom of expression. Uh, the international higher education community refers to a university as the repository of truth, as a place where the critical intellectual mind of a society engaging um, in the quest for truth, meet and argue chasing for this ideal, but the scholarly elite comes together, abandons absolute findings, and then reconsiders and defends other interpretations of truth. And this key task uh, of the universities of uh, discovering and disseminating the truth can be entirely accomplished only if universities will respect and benefit from academic freedom. Uh, talking about one of the elements of academic freedom, uh, freedom of teaching, uh, there have been a number of cases where professors were accused of introducing tendentious political or ideological matters into their teaching. And uh, it is agreed that academics cannot act in favor of silencing alternative views or teach without uh, due regard for the equal consideration of conflicting opinions and uh, with failing to maintain balance and neutrality. Uh, certain utterances, uh, inactivity and uh, behavior of uh, academics uh, do fall outside the, the scope of academic freedom and rather are considered as a violation of professional duties or abuse of their academic freedom. As any other freedom, academic freedom must be balanced with certain obligations, and certainly there are uh, limits. Uh, academics in the classroom are required uh, to teach uh, in a manner that reflects uh, current thinking, uh, recent research, uh, and a variety of uh, views and opinions. Uh, they are also required not to introduce in their teaching any element of positive or negative uh, bias, distortion, misrepresentation, uh, stigmatizing or irrelevant oral and written statements uh, in respect to different matters like age, economic status, uh, ethnicity, gender, language, uh, nationality unless these relate directly to the subject matter. Uh, however, it is not that simple to maintain the balance uh, between uh, being critical, deviating from and uh, questioning uh, generally accepted uh, beliefs, introducing experimentation and speculation in the classroom, and alongside, alongside being uh, in conformity with the professional norms. Another important and rather complex uh, element of academic freedom is uh, extramural speech, uh, which uh, refers to speech made by academics in their capacity as citizens and uh, not in their capacity as officers or employees of higher education institutions and on matters of uh, public concerns that are not related to their academic uh, expertise or institutional aff affiliation. Um, some scholars note that if a university censors what 
its professors may say as citizens in public and restrains them from uh, utterances it does not approve, it thereby assumes the power to establish what particular opinions it permits and accordingly assumes full responsibility for whatever it permits. American Association of University Professors advocates for the freedom of extramural speech in a sense that uh, academics, although members of academic community and officers of higher education institutions are also citizens. And when they speak or write as citizens, they should be free uh, from any institutional censorship or discipline. Uh, that should leave them in the position of uh, every other citizen who have to take full responsibility for what they speak or write and who have to answer to public authorities according to the national laws. Uh, there are plenty of examples of academics having uh, their position at university in jeopardy because of uh, their academic uh, speech or conduct. Uh, we have a number of cases where academics consistently deny the existence of uh, uh, such events as uh, global warming, uh, the Holocaust, uh, mass shootings. And while they may merit respect with their uh, established academic disciplines, it's argued that they are permitted to proclaim what would be described as nonsense on other disciplines. Uh, scholars note that uh, an electric engineering professor who embraces Holocaust denial outside the classroom is protected uh, by academic, academic freedom as long as he never imposes his neo-Nazi views uh, and values upon his students. It is argued that uh, no sanctions can be initiated by the university if uh, that is never mentioned in the classroom uh, statements reflect only personal view and not uh, those of institution or its faculty and that uh, professor continues uh, to adequately teach uh, the subject matter of his expertise. Uh, thus, a Holocaust uh, denying modern European historian could claim no comparable degree of deference uh, and would be subject to the termination of even a tenured position on the basis of demonstrated incompetence. Uh, there is another example of uh, the case that was brought to the Human Rights uh, Committee. Uh, a university professor was uh, convicted for the offense of Holocaust denial as he had sought proof for the methods of killings by gas asphyxiation, thereby raising doubts regarding the existence of gas chambers for extermination purposes at Auschwitz and in other Nazi concentration camps. Um, he claimed that his opinions uh, were rejected by academic journals. He has become uh, the target uh, of death threats, uh, suffered physical assault and serious uh, injuries. The committee stated that there was no violation of Article 19 of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which protects the right to hold opinions and freedom of expression. The committee argued that uh, the restriction was provided by law and the conviction uh, was fully justified not only by the necessity of securing uh, a respect for the judgment of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and through it the memory of the survivors and the descendants of the victims of uh, Nazism, but also by the necessity of uh, maintaining uh, social cohesion and public order. Uh, although academic freedom provides a protection to speak out and provide a critical voice, there's also an opinion that being uh, members of the academic community imposes upon them a burden by the nature of their special position in the society, 
which creates special obligations for them. Uh, it is argued that uh, as scholars and educational officers, they should, they should remember that the public may judge their profession and their institution by their utterances. Hence, they should at all times be accurate, should exercise appropriate restraint, should show respect uh, for the opinions of others and should make every effort to indicate uh, that uh, they are not speaking for the, for the institution. Uh, thus, for a conclusion that uh, uh, leaves us uh, with two a bit uh, conflicting remarks. On one hand, it means that academics possess a lesser amount of freedom of speech because they bear a burden of being representatives of the academic profession and they are accordingly bound by obligations which must be regarded in the light of their responsibilities to their subject, to their students, to their profession, and to their institution. Uh, academics have a particular obligation to advance culture of free inquiry and to foster public understanding of academic freedom. On the other hand, uh, the justification for the protection of extramural utterances uh, can be found in the idea that it's often difficult to draw the line between the speech within academics' expertise from one which fall outside the scope of expertise. Accordingly, in order to maintain a conducive environment to the performance of fundamental professional tasks when academics are able to focus entirely on their professional responsibilities, rather than feeling unconfident in regard to public utterances, any attempt of trying to set the limits should be discouraged. So that would be uh, my thoughts on academic freedom and its, uh, its uh, limitations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and especially thank you for, for, for time discipline. Uh, I again, I have comments which I cannot make at this moment uh, because time is now. And we will move to the next uh, speaker and the last in this session, Dr. Leah uh, David, who is uh, the assistant professor at Ad Astra Fellow at the School of Sociology, University College Dublin. She is a comparative historical sociologist with a strong interdisciplinary background in cultural anthropology and history. Uh, she completed her PhD at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ben Gurion University, Israel, and she has held several uh, very impressive postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, she also writes extensively um, on um, uh, issues like memory nationalism, human rights, ideologies, solidarity, etc. Um, uh, Dr. David uh, will present now with the topic ideological frameworks of the juridification of the past. And there's my kind request also for, for time discipline. Dr. David, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you for having me here. I think this is a super, super important uh, subject to discuss. And as uh, you said at the beginning, there are many angles to tackle this uh, uh, issue. And uh, I want to add another component uh, to this discussion, and that is ideology, because I think it is very important to understand those different laws through different uh, ideological frameworks. Oh, this works. This is excellent. So I think it is important to understand that when we talk about now uh, about memorization laws, we are generally talking about two different ideological uh, worldviews. One is that of nationalism that is supported by a nation state uh, uh, at the nation state level. And the other one is something that is more of a macro level. If we understand nationalism as a, as a meso level in a, in a global system, uh, that is of uh, human rights. And when we think about those two different um, memorization uh, laws and memorization practices, we see very different uh, uh, practices in place. So we say on the uh, one hand, we see nation state sponsored memory. And on the other hand, we see this uh, moral remembrance that is uh, tightly connected uh, to the human rights memorization agenda. And I'm going to, going to talk about it a, a bit more. So um, 
of course, those uh, uh, different um, ideologies are really uh, different. Uh, nationalism is always marked uh, and or marks clear na national boundaries and promotes this idea of natural place of a limited number of people. Whereas when we talk about uh, human rights, uh, uh, human rights supposedly rejects all uh, um, that rights should be privileged and ascribed by any categorical division of uh, such as uh, ethnicity, religion, class or gender. Uh, I'm talking here about this uh, new global phenomena, this what they call moral remembrance uh, that have become deeply rooted in human rights mobilization practices and norms. It is meant to force states to face and become accountable for past human rights abuses. In that stands, uh, sense, uh, states are expected, uh, however, of course, uh, not in an even or equal manner to conform to these uh, international human rights norms of facing their criminal past and becoming accountable for massive human rights uh, abuses. However, although states often willingly adopt or at least pretend to adopt human rights memorization agendas and norms, uh, memorization agendas are always uh, exclusively enforced through different forms of international pressures and often we are talking here about different treaties and, and peace agreements. And this is because nation states sees their natural or exclusive right in promoting memorization agendas as means to homogenize those distant uh, people that belong to the same uh, community. So it is important to stress uh, though that the human rights memorization agenda is always filtered through the needs of, uh, of uh, any nation state. It always actually, uh, whether states, uh, nation states will take this uh, moral remembrance and the human rights memorization agenda, it is always uh, uh, going to be adopted, adopted only as long as it serves the needs of this nation state. Wait. Okay, so this moral re uh, remembrance is uh, grounded uh, in, uh, in the most basic presumptions uh, in human rights and transitional justice, that proper memorization is essential for healing societies. We heard about it uh, uh, with a difficult past and moving beyond the trauma and uh, uh, violence. That proper memorization is a crucial step in establishing moral responsibility for past atrocities, and that proper memorization uh, can guarantee the establishment of human rights values and can bring to reconciliation. I will not go uh, much into it. Uh, I, I actually dispute all of these claims in my uh, book that I, that has been just published. I just want to move here to this component, why it is important to understand, in my opinion, human rights uh, as an ideology, just as we can understand it, uh, uh, we are, can understand nationalism as an ideology. In that sense, it is very helpful to rely on sociology of ideologies because we see that for any ideology, we have those three components. Oh, apologies. Uh, one is this uh, organizational power, meaning that human rights, just as, uh, as uh, nationalism, needs to have institutions in, in place. Uh, second component is ideological power, or in this um, story that I'm telling here, is about content and about the standardization of memory. I'm not going to talk about this uh, more, uh, but, it, oh, sorry, something is happening. Uh, but what is here important in this uh, context of, uh, of the human rights memorization agenda, that uh, we see this historical process where three distinct uh, principles uh, have been adopted, facing the past, duty to remember, and victim-centered approach. And the third component is, of course, micro-solidarity, meaning what actually happens on the ground uh, uh, with uh, this uh, ideological and uh, organizational power. So, uh, what is important here to understand that uh, uh, when we talk about this uh, human rights as an ideo ideology and about nationalism, we always talk about ideologies that tend to homogenize and monopolize human knowledge and advocate 
how the world should look like. So obviously there are always going to be tension between those two different uh, approaches. So what is actually this uh, moral remembrance? This is a standardized set of norms based on human rights values. And um, uh, actually it is a, this a generative, uh, it refers to this generative process of standardization of memory at the global level. It defines the proper ways in which societies are supposed to deal with the legacies of human rights abuses. Uh, and it has this guiding principle to force states to face and become accountable. So the way we understand his uh, moral remembrance is uh, uh, this ex ex exactly uh, that it refers to these standardized ways to promote it through the human rights infrastructure at the global level in which societies are supposed to deal with legacies of massive human rights abuses. Again, this process refers to a gradual accumulative development from duty to remember. And this is important as an awareness oriented approach to a contested past to a policy oriented proper memorizations what needs to be remembered something that has been standardized in a in a way that it is supposed to serve us as an insurance policy against the repetition of massive human rights abuses so the way we understand historical injustice today around the world uh is predominantly shaped by this uh, human rights memorization standards, again, which I call here moral remembrance, that adopted those three main principles, uh, the necessity to collectively force, um, uh, face a troubled past, collective duty to remember human rights abuses, and this victim-centered approach that puts vic victims at the heart of memorization um, efforts. So uh, through all these three, though all those three uh, principles are very uh, distinct and have different uh, sociological historical trajectories and are rooted in distinct ethical and philosophical ideals, they merge and they become pillars of this human rights memorization agenda. In fact, the, the emergence of moral remembrance uh, and its extensive promotion by human rights bodies and advocates has shaped our current understanding how the proper way to remember past atrocities and massive human rights abuses should look like. And this, I think this uh, conference also reflects that in a way. So I'm talking here about new phenomena, global phenomena of moral remembrance that have become deeply, deeply rooted in these human rights uh, uh, memorization practices and norms. And let's see now how it uh, brings us to Sorry. Two laws. Uh, again, this is important here to understand that uh, the institutionalization of a selective memory as means of homogenizing people under one governmental system can be traced uh, from the Treaty of uh, Westphalia in 1640. Eight uh, and the Treaty of Westphalia obliged states to enforce amnesties and pardons for all war uh, time uh, wrong uh, doings. Uh, since then, uh, it changed tremendously. But we can see that throughout the 18th century, museums, for example, transforms into sites of glories and podiums of states' achievements. Museums and national calendars gradually transform into instruments. Uh, of citizenship and uh, and uh, nation state uh, agendas energizing uh, this national unity and cultural homogeneity homogeneity uh, and also we can see um, however that only after the second world war did a coupling of the accountability for human rights abuses and their remembrance will emerge within the local uh, legal framework as means of restoring moral cosmologies uh, within international arenas. So nation states, nation state memory laws use and contextualize certain memory contents tailored in a such a way to secure national exclusive boundaries of belonging. And we talked about it a bit here. Contrary to that, human rights sponsored memory laws are utilized with regard to difficult and violent histories and they're focused around two central categories, 
one that bans and criminal, criminalizes uh, a positive perception uh, of an atrocity pa uh, past, such as a genocide or massive uh, violence, and the other that bans a negative perspective, uh, perception of a violent past. So those attitudes are also reflected in what is called the militant uh, democracy, which refers to this uh, prohibition of a hatred uh, uh, rights of uh, free speech uh, in to preserve this liberal democracy. So uh, here, for example, we see uh, all kinds of um, uh, Holocaust uh, denial laws or uh, legis uh, legislation criminalizing, criminalizing the Nazi message. Uh, uh, and uh, we can see other example here as well as uh, genocide uh, denial laws that all come as a remedy and they come uh, from this human rights memorialization agenda uh, and not from a nation state memorialization agenda. Now, of course, in the same way, we see that memory laws often serve as a legal remedies uh, to nation states so uh, from the, that point on uh, those two often contradicting sets of memorialization laws started operating simultaneously that that comes from human rights and the other that comes from nation state on the one hand memorialization laws in the international arenas became coupled with the, both the Declaration of uh, Human Rights and uh, with Convention on the Prevention of and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide as legally by binding document. On the other hand, the memorialization laws within nation states did not choose uh, to exist, but were further conceptualized to serve as means of legitimizing the social political reality and to homogenize a group within their nation state. In practice, this meant that both human rights and nation state led memorialization laws were vastly invented towards securization of memory, offering different visions of future. And securization of memory here refers to the process in which, uh, by means of law, certain historical remembrances are secured, while others are completely delegitimized and criminalized. All memory laws, regardless of their ideological uh, source, became central to the politics of memory, as we heard that uh, from other um, uh, discussions, uh, that is, uh, to the political means by which events are classified, commemorated, or discarded in order to influence communities' values and attitude. So in that means, securitization of memory by means of law is a really fascinating uh, phenomena that is clear that clearly brings the distinction between the nationalist as opposed to human rights understanding of memory and i think this is crucial here so once human rights sponsored laws and resolutions were introduced in international arenas to mark the boundaries of an imagined collective based on this abstract notion of humanity as a whole states responded in a very similar memor, uh, manner, while simultaneously adopting the laws that protect the universe, universality of human uh, rights, uh, while at the same time, in the local setting, they pushed for the adoption of discriminatory laws in order to safeguard their uh, narrowly understood ethnic boundaries. And this is important because we can see uh, national entities that uh, do simultaneously both. They, they adopt uh, human rights uh, memorialization laws, but they, at the same time, they actually enforce uh, some um, laws that are beyond, that are actually very uh, nationally uh, binding. And what comes naturally as, uh, as part of it is actually this uh, historical revisionism and we talked about it here some so, uh, some of you mentioned that uh, the the this uh, phenomena uh, so though uh, just a second um the phenomena that goes hand in hand 
with memory loss is this historical uh, revisionism. And historical revisionism is, of course, not a novel phenomenon on the country. On, on the contrary, it appears as evidence of ideological cracks. It aims to reshape, in a way, historical records, and it is widely understood in a negative terms as a distortion or denial of history uh, for a very narrow, of, often uh, ethnic, uh, national purposes. Uh, there is, uh, of course, examples that we can see from uh, Hungary, Poland, Serbia, Ukraine, and many, many other places of this attempt to, to uh, bring this historical uh, revisionism. But there is one thing that is very important to understand, that this concept of historical uh, revisionism is a slippery concept. Not only does our knowledge revision, uh, uh, revision through progress, but most of the crucial paradigms of recent centuries, such as feminism or historical justice movements, started actually as revisionist projects. Different historical revisionist movements uh, uh, are guided by different moral premises, and their success is divine, uh, defined through their ability to acquire uh, resources and support their uh, struggle. Human rights ideology, uh, ideology with its organizational and ideological capacities provided legitimacy for the rise of certain uh, revisionist, uh, revisionist uh, uh, projects uh, such as uh, historical justice movements globally. Uh, and we see this uh, example for uh, historical justice. And when we talk about it, we will never dispute it. We will never say, oh, well, this is historical revisionism. So it is always the point of, of, uh, of uh, uh, who is speaking, actually, and through which uh, ideological lenses we are arguing that this phenomena is historical revisionism. In a way, there are some historical uh, sorts of uh, historical revisionisms that we adopt and, uh, and we promote and we cherish and we see them welcome, while some other historical revisionisms we actually uh, ban. Uh, and again, it all comes to the way in which uh, we understand our ideological uh, positioning in that. And I just want to uh, end by saying that the clashing uh, notions of morality sponsored by different uh, ideologies result in a variety of practices and discourses. On the one hand, it often results in a strengthening, actually, nationalist sentiments through the adoption of uh, discriminatory memory laws and state-promoted uh, historical revisionism that undermines historical facts for the sake of valorizing and uh, uh, deeds committed in the name of the nation. But on the other hand, it seems uh, that it actually enables wide networks of solidarities that are meant to right the wrongs of the past. However, the real and I think uh, yet largely hidden impact of those clashing systems of moralities is in fact the production of new social uh, inequalities on the ground. And I just put it here because I don't have time to, to, to explain it more. Uh, Again, just to uh, conclude with one sentence, I think to in order to understand uh, memorization laws, we need to understand their ideological premises and how they operate uh, in realities. Thank you. Uh, Dr. David, uh, well, um, it seems we have some time for discussion. I'm terribly sorry for that, uh, that it happened on, on my watch. And uh, of course, um, I am told by the organizers that it's, it's vital that we start the next session on time. But nevertheless, we still have the opportunity to uh, engage into some discussion um, and also to have a coffee break, which might be a little shorter than scheduled. But I would like to open the floor for questions or comments. Um, should there be any comments or questions to the speakers? My understanding is that we discuss among ourselves. I haven't actually consulted it, but I understand that um, we, do, at the moment, we uh, have any questions from outside the panel. Am I correct, Professor Radvan? That seems to be the case. So I, again, would like to, to invite our panelists and uh, 
uh, because to uh, perhaps engage in some form of dialogue. Professor uh, uh, Izzy uh go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. This was a uh, fascinating uh, uh, session, listening to uh, a number of different um, uh, lines of arguments. And uh, still, I, uh, I have this uh, uh, um, question for Dr. David um, uh, about the difference between uh, you said historical justice and historical revisionism, and then you admitted that uh, even justice is based on the permanent uh, revision of um, memory and of the past. Yes, yeah? so what we tell, uh, what we don't tell, and uh, um, my question is: To what extent do you believe that these? Claims from human rights are actually moral claims and whether they can be juridified. This is because uh, this panel is on the juridification. So to what extent do you take human rights as a moral struggle for emancipation, uh, recognition, inclusion, and so on? And to what extent do you take it as this <laughs> actually nation state sponsored juridification of uh, the memory? Uh, thank you for this question. Yeah. I refer it immediately to Dr. David. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, it is interesting. It is really good question. Uh, I, I, I wrote extensively how the whole concept, first of all, how memory became adopted within this uh, uh, frames of human rights. That was not a uh, um, natural, so to say, uh, connection. So it developed uh, but it started developing really from a, a very pure moral um, ideals. But what it became, again, with this shift from something that has to be a, a we should talk about our past because something bad happened. And you know, if we don't do it, something bad will continue happening. To this, that we have a policy oriented standards of memory and proper, proper way of uh, uh, remembering, which is uh, actually a toolkit of all kinds of issues, including uh, memory loss, that if we do X, Y, Z, then we'll end up having this. So it is completely different th than how it started. And if we add to that discussion also uh, this whole movement of historical justice, uh, Historical justice movements, of course, uh, is, uh, is a legitimate in, and is claiming uh, real uh, injustices that happened in the past. But the way they are doing it there, it is often by using this uh, human rights memorization agenda, actually, because it gives them tools to promote further their agendas. But if we dig deeper or go further with that, we often see that actually it is not very different from identity politics and it ends up uh, having this uh, enforcing very narrow ethnically bounding uh, 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 agendas. So we see how it is being used, those uh, uh, human rights mobilization agenda, but it actually at the end ends up having the same effect. It's actually strengthening uh, nationalism and those sentiments. So uh, in that sense, I mean, there is always this struggle because because of uh, this uh, appearance of uh, those uh, nationally uh, national memorization laws, we will have this uh, reaction that people will come and say, oh, we will bind, we will have some new solidarities in place and this is a good thing, you know, but then we will end up uh, cycling and perpetuating actually very same narrative through identity politics that is briefly. Thank you, Dr. David. And I am encouraging perhaps uh, one or two more questions. Uh, we don't have this yellow hand here, but we are among uh, panelists, so uh, no, no yellow hands are necessary. I, if there are no further questions, I myself, if I thought one, uh, I, uh, that's a question to, to Dr. Pasvenskiene, because uh, I think everybody here is a we are all fans of academic freedom and academic debate. Uh, but my question is would be the following. 
in essence, would you argue that as academics acting with an academic freedom, in fact, are we under the same standards concerning free speech, Article 19 you mentioned, or I don't know of your questions, so, uh, um, that we act under exactly the same standards, even if you speak in, in, in academia, or perhaps we should take more on the duties, responsibilities which come along, um, but also maybe we have larger freedom. Maybe, in fact, we say almost anything when we speak ex cathedra. So, in essence, do you think that we exercise freedom of speech uh, entitled? Are we, is it legitimate to say that as academics we um, uh, can say more and be protected legally? Thank you. Yes, I actually agree and would say yes. I argued uh, the same, uh, tried to justify this argument in my doctoral thesis, saying that as academics, we might have a broader or a wider freedom uh, of speech and to be protected. The thing is that when we talk about academic freedom, it's uh, it's a relation between an academic and uh, a university or institution that uh, the scholar represents. So if a professor or an academic is uh, discussing or researching or teaching uh, in the field of his or her expertise, then I would say yes, uh, uh, he or she deserves a wider protection just because the person is an academic. Thank you. Um, I see a raised hand by Dr. David. We still have, I, I hope, three or five minutes. Dr. David. Uh, thank you. I have a question for uh, Professor Preben. Uh, you said several times that uh, if we don't deal uh, with the problematic past properly, we are doomed to repeat it. And this is what I can say a trope in uh, transitional justice, in human rights memorization agenda the whole concept, if we don't do this, we'll end up this. Can you please give me, give us an example, uh, and you mentioned that, but I would like to go uh, a bit more uh, in detail with that. What do you consider as uh, we dealt with it? And we actually managed to go beyond this um, problematic past. Any example? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it's a uh, core question because uh, I uh, my next sentence would be yes. If we don't deal with the past, the past will deal with us, and uh, no past can be um, dealt with entirely. It is a permanent process of. That's why I was so interested in human rights and revisionism because we we constantly revise it, and we have a. Uh, we have some uh, collective memories which then constitute our moral and political canons. Never again, yeah, like, uh, and uh, we have to learn from totalitarian, authoritarian past. Um, and uh, so, uh, but how we perceive it changes over time. I can give you one example uh, how this is flexible and in permanent evolution. Uh, um, an example from the Czech history, because uh, what is interesting is uh, that the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, so we study both communism and the Nazi occupation. And uh, uh, there is uh, the Czech collective memory was for a long time based on this victim who first Munich, uh, then uh, uh, February 1948 and uh, communism and our wonderful liberal democratic past of the First Republic was permanently uh, crushed uh, first by the Nazis, then by the communists. And only now, only now, just last month, Czech TV was broadcasting, I, I think, two or three part documentary about the expulsion of ethnic Germans, uh, three million people after 1945, yeah? which uh, 
in the past would be dealt with, of course, it was a matter of historical justice because they deserved it. They went with Hitler in 38, they, did, uh, they dismantled Czechoslovak uh, uh, Republic and that's what they deserved. So it was almost justice as revenge. And now with the mercy of the past and of the history, I think the Czech public is coming to terms that actually what was presented as justice was uh, uh, incorporating atrocious acts of violence, injustice, harm, and actually uh, it had a detrimental effect on what happened in uh, uh, subsequent uh, years and decades. So uh, this is one example how no past can be uh, ever um uh, dealt with uh, without uh, any further dealing it's a process um what is what is however important to distinguish it from was is that uh, you mustn't uh, marginalize or uh, uh, while, while for instance czech republic has the holocaust denial crime it's uh, it's a um, and uh, um, it's a pity we don't have uh, Dr. Matushek uh, uh, with us anymore because uh, I'm very ambivalent about the Holocaust denial laws, but at the same time it's a part of collective memory. Yeah, it's uh, if you don't uh, address this problem of uh, people openly faking the past horrors, then it's you're giving up on your identity. And we bear responsibility for this as a collective. So uh, I have strong understanding for the Holocaust denial laws. And it was done in the early 1990s in the Czech Republic with, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Priman. Uh, well, uh, I'm afraid that we need to um, uh, wrap up and come, come to an end of the discussion given the um, that next session is about to start in 10 minutes. So again, um, apologies that we had to shorten this discussion um, uh, part a bit. But nevertheless, I'd like to thank uh, all speakers. I'd like to thank um, everybody for joining and for sharing with us. Uh, this was extremely inter interesting. And I'm also again looking forward to, um, to the publication, which I, uh, I understand we will a co-author and that's of course again um, a great uh, uh, idea i think uh, of uh, professor advance and and his team so um, having said that i believe that my duties as a chairman of this session might come to an end uh, professor Radvan would probably never invite me again in this capacity because uh, i prolonged it a little uh, but um, i think that this is the moment to say thank you and uh, and see you soon uh, would Professor Radvan uh, like to uh, also have something to say uh, in terms of uh, uh, closing the session? Uh, no, thank you. We uh, already limited our well-deserved coffee break by more than a half. So I would be hated by anyone if I wanted not to talk. So I would like to thank you for chairing uh, the session and to the speakers for their highly interesting contributions. And we all deserve the break. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good uh, well day and afternoon. Uh, actually, I'll be seeing you in uh, some of you in 10 minutes. So thank you and uh, all the best.